<laughs> Sorry. Sabrina won't say that. I hope. I think we're live. <laughs> it's just a live for him. We're live, guys. We're live? Great. Yes. Awesome. Well, hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Plugged Into History. This is On the Farm Wednesday, and we are back downtown this week here at the Edmonston Alston House. You might not be watching this on Middleton Place's live stream, though, which is awesome. So if you're watching from the EA House Facebook, hey, what's up? Nice to see you. And if you are watching from the Charleston Museum Facebook page, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here. As you can see in your screen, we have some wonderful guests here. Um, Heather Rivet, the House Museum's manager for the Charleston Museum, has graciously agreed to join us there at the Hayward Washington House. So this um, is all about urban plantations this week. We are here at EA with Virginia. Hello. Um, hello. And we're going to talk again about urban plantations and the wharf yard. So right behind us is the yard at the Edmonston Olson House. And as you will see shortly, it looks very different from the yard at the Hayward Washington House. So I'm going to step out of the frame and get back behind the camera. And I'm going to ask Virginia if you wouldn't mind to talk a little bit about this space. We've also got Caitlin here behind the camera. Say hi, Caitlin. Good morning, everyone. And so these two are going to tell you a little bit about the EA House. And then we're going to throw it over to Heather. And she's got some great information and some great visuals for you. So stick right here with us. We've got a lot of great info for you. All right, I'm gonna go take my place right back behind the phone. All right, hey everyone. So like Karen said, my name is Virginia. I am the interpretive coordinator and volunteer coordinator here at the Edmonton Alston House. The area that you see behind me and really the workyard at Edward Washington House, today both look very different to how they would have looked uh, back in their heyday for the Hayward Washington House in the 18th century and for here in the 19th century. Um, work yards, while today we sort of use this as a little parking lot area and nice green space, work yards were really just that. So these areas typically had livestock roaming around, so chickens, a goat, maybe a cow even. This is where all the work of the enslaved servants here took place. So the building that you're seeing in front of you here was the original kitchen house of the Hayward, or excuse me, of the Edmondson Alston House. The first floor there, we had a kitchen and laundry. Above it, the next two floors were slave quarters where 16 to 20 enslaved workers lived. Um, we also have a carriage house still in existence here, straight back ahead of us. First floor there would have had stables and maybe a small tack room. And then above it was sort of just a hayloft where the enslaved groomsmen and coachmen would have slept as well. Today, these buildings are not really open as part of the museum, but we're very lucky to have these structures still standing to help tell the history of the enslaved workers that lived here and really aid our interpretations. Uh, these buildings have been renovated into a modern bed and breakfast, which is why we're not going inside of them today, um, but you'll get a good sense of what these authentic uh, kitchen buildings and carriage houses look like through our friends at the Hayward Washington House today. And make sure that if you have any questions for Virginia and Caitlin and Heather that you ask them, drop them right in the comments. We are monitoring all three comments section, the museum, uh, Middleton Place and EA House. So wherever you're watching, we can see you. Let us know where you're watching from. Thank you very much for joining us and drop your questions in. We're happy to answer them for you. So, all right, you got anything else or shall we? Uh... I think we shall throw it on to Heather. All right. So we're going to leave right. our screen here and we're going to um, just give you this beautiful view of the yard while, um, but hopefully you can make Heather big in your screen, please, and check out the Hayward Washington house. So take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you for uh, having us involved in this. It's really cool to have multiple sites so we can show uh, multiple perspectives of what urban life would have been like for um, the enslaved. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, my name is Heather Rivet. I'm the historic house manager for the Charleston Museum. Um, and so part of my purview is taking care of the Hayward Washington House, which is the house that I'm standing in front of. Um, that's the backside behind me. So I'm going to go ahead and flip my camera and talk a little bit more about uh, the workyard and what you see 
here. So um, as I mentioned, uh, behind me here is the Hayward Washington House. This house was completed in uh, 1772. Uh, it gets its name from Thomas Hayward Jr., uh, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And it was also where George Washington stayed when he was touring uh, the South after, um, after he was elected president. So he stayed here for 10 days. So that's where we get our name, the Hayward Washington House. And we are very fortunate to still have um, these outbuildings back here, these dependencies that would have, that did support uh, the main house. You can see over here, we have the kitchen house, much like the one at the Edmonton Austin house, you have kitchen and laundry on the main floor, uh, which I'll take you inside in a moment. And then on the second and third floors up there, that's where the enslaved quarters would have been. Um, actually, we know there, those spaces were divided into three or sorry, three rooms on the second floor and two rooms on the third floor for a total of uh, five rooms up there. Now, unfortunately, we don't have uh, exact numbers for how many enslaved would have been here working on the site uh, when Thomas Hayward owned the house, but we do know from the 1790s census uh, that there were 17 enslaved living and working here on the site. So that's 17 individuals divided among those five rooms up there. Um, over on the other side, again, much like the Edmund Nelson house, we have our carriage house here. Uh, it was carriage house, stable, as well as a tack room. Um, so, and one thing to note about our yard, we are a little further inland on the peninsula than the Edmonton Nelson house. Uh, so it's not as wide, um, not quite as much space. Uh, house is a little bit closer together in this part of town. Um, so our yard is a little more narrow, but much like Virginia was saying, um, this would have been a space that would have had animals. There would have been a lot of activity going on out here. I'll go a little further down and show you. We also still have um, the original privies back here. This was a uh, two-sided necessary building, also original to the house. So today we have these beautiful ornamental gardens. Uh, that the Garden Club of Charleston takes care of for us. Um, but when the, the Haywards were here, this would have been more of a work yard, um, not necessarily the decorative garden that you see today. One other thing to note about this space before um, we go inside is the wall. Um, now it gives us kind of this quaint garden feel back here, uh, but these walls were very intentional. Um, it was intended to let the enslaved know that this is the space where they were confined to. Uh, their only way out was uh, either through the house or uh, down the carriage lane there next to the house. So it was a means um, uh, of, of having that control. And if you note, we do have windows on this side of uh, the enslaved quarters up there, but there are no windows on the other side. So there wasn't even a view out um, to outside of the wall. So, uh, it designed to let them know that the inside the walls was their um, whole world. And I just noticed that we, looks like we have a question that came in from the, um, so I'll see if I can get to that. I want to be able to answer the question. Let oh, me know so, if you can't get to it. Okay, you got it? Good. Yep. So uh, do we know how many enslaved the family owned or how many would have stayed in the house? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have that information uh, for Thomas Hayward. Uh, the 1790 census indicated 17 enslaved um, at that time. So that's the, we're still trying to do some research to learn a little bit more about that here for this site. Uh, so we can provide a little more information uh, for interpretation. So and here we are. Um, Oh, go we ahead. might have a little bit of info on that for the Edmonston Alston House. Of course, it's in the next century. It's in the 19th century, but for on this property. Mm -hmm. So on this property, we know that in 1850 there were 17 people enslaved on this property downtown here. Many, many more owned by the Alstons out on their plantations. Um, and then 10 years later, in 1860, we know that there were 18 people. Um, and those, those numbers all come from the slave censuses that were done in those years. Um, they do not give us any names. They just give us numbers. Um, 
how many people, what their ages were and what their gender was. Great, right on, thanks. Sorry, Heather, go ahead. Oh, no, no problem. So um, in here, as I go into the kitchen building, you can see um, this is the kitchen side of the house. Uh, at this end, we actually have a spot where there would have been um, two fires going. So I think this was mentioned yesterday uh, on your stream about the kitchen building always being separate uh, from the main house after the huge uh, fire in Charleston in the 17, 1740. So again, that's why it was separate here. So, and not only that, but it also helped with temperature control inside the house because these two fires would have been going pretty much all the time. So to have that in a separate building uh, helps keep the main house a little bit cooler. Uh, we have the main fireplace that would have been for cooking. Uh, we also have a smaller um, oven to the side for baking. Now this was set up, I believe in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, after the museum had acquired the Hayward Washington house. Uh, over the years, we have had a little more research done by um, some pain analysis and um, an architecture specialist. Uh, so we've learned things like, and I don't know how well you can see it here, but if you take a look at these back walls, you can see where there would have been shelving back here originally attached to the walls. So likely a long countertop against that space as well. Now this space does allow us, as I mentioned, to do a little more interpretation about the enslaved on the site. Uh, we've had a few archeological digs on our site that have given us a lot of information about how, um, what life was like for the enslaved here. And we have found a few of these. Um, these were called slave badges. Uh, if a family had an enslaved person with a trade, uh, they could register them with the city for a fee and then they could be hired out uh, to do work for other families. Uh, so this was a way of the family earning additional income. Occasionally, the enslaved would be able to earn additional income. And this is something that's uh, unique to urban plantations and urban slavery, uh, obviously not a common practice out uh, in the country on those plantations. And, you, you know, um, interestingly enough, uh, we actually have one of those badges on display at the Middleton Place House Museum. So this is something that's definitely common to planter families. Oh, we have some here, too, as well. The ladies are telling me. Great. So, um, you know, once these spaces reopen, um, if that's something of interest to you in terms of visiting, uh, we highly encourage you to, to come and specifically and directly ask questions because that was a system that's unique to the low country and uh, really um, demonstrative of, of how the economy was really run and, and pursued here. Um, Heather, I think we had a question from Facebook. Did you see that one come in? Um, let me double check. If you want to know, can uh, we look at the stairs? Why or why not? Okay, so <laughs> unfortunately, we cannot go upstairs. Uh, at some point, a good portion of the HVAC system for the house <laughs> was, was installed upstairs on uh, the second floor here. So it's not currently uh, a space that's being interpreted um, as the enslaved quarters. So um, unfortunately, we don't, we can't allow visitors up there right now. But as we learn more about those spaces, we're hoping possibly through uh, more panels like these um, or other programs, we can give people a better idea of what life would have been like up there. So uh, I apologize for that, but we will not be going upstairs today. So this side, the side that I just moved to, this is the laundry side of the house. Again, pretty typical, uh, like you mentioned at the Edmondson Austin house, half would have been for kitchen, half laundry. Again, you have a fire going on this side. You have the, the tub for washing and for soaking, as well as a number of irons um, for that purpose as well. We have a little more information. Um, the Hayward Washington house was actually the site of the first controlled archeology span dig here in Charleston. Um, so over 100,000 artifacts were discovered out in the yard where we just were. So that's given us 
a lot of insight um, into how the enslaved lived. Because as we've mentioned, there's often not a lot of written documentation, which is why we rely heavily on census. Um, and if enslaved people happen to be mentioned in their enslavers' letters or diaries, um, but the material objects that we can find out in the yard here um, really help us with that type of interpretation. So that's uh, my overview here. I don't know if there's uh, anything else specific, if we have any other questions, um, or if there's anything that's else you awesome. wanted to comment on. Yeah, thank you oh. so much, Heather. Let's reiterate that if you've got questions and comments, folks, please, you have three different avenues to put them in. So <laughs> we want to hear from you um, on the Charleston Museum Facebook page, on the Edmonston Alston Facebook page, and on the uh, Middleton Place Facebook page. We do have another one. Do you see that coming in, Heather? Yes, I did see that Great. coming in. Go so a um, little more information about the upstairs here. So as you can see, there are the four windows across there. And the second floor is divided into three rooms. Now, the interesting thing is um, one of the rooms, they're not equal size. One of the rooms takes up the entire uh, back portion here. So the floor is cut in half, but this entire back portion is one large room. Meanwhile, this space up here would have been divided down the middle for two smaller rooms. So that does indicate that there would have been some sort of hierarchy within the enslaved uh, on this site as far as who got the quote unquote better space. Um, another interesting thing that we found and as it's compared to other uh, enslaved quarters, uh, we found evidence of a closet with shelves up there, which is pretty unusual. And some other architectural details um, that you don't typically see in enslaved quarters. And then on the top floor there, those would have been two rooms just divided uh, in half down the middle. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there are um, the windows, but only on this side of the house, there are no windows uh, facing out. So there are, some other, there are some other questions um, from the Middleton Place stream. Um, we want to know, do we know how often women washed their dresses and would they have dried them outdoors on clotheslines? And someone else is curious where the bricks from the Hayward Washington house were made, if you happen to know. So washing and drying dresses and then bricks where they were made, if, if we have any idea. Um, so as far as the washing and drying of dresses, I believe it's our understanding laundry was done um, weekly. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that. And um, I can't say speak for sure to the clothesline either. That's not something um, that I'm uh, sure of. We yeah, do that's know not something that, that really shows up archaeologically. No, <laughs> no, unfortunately. Um, the bricks uh, were made locally. Um, I, don't, I don't have more specifics than that. I do know, and I can't remember, I apologize, where they are off the top of my head, but some of our bricks here do have um, fingerprints in them uh, from where they were made uh, by the enslaved who were making bricks in this area. And um, to plug the museum, there's a great exhibit in the Charleston Museum all about uh, brick making in this area uh, and uh, what we've learned from the fingerprints that have been found in the bricks. And while we're talking about bricks, I think I saw another question just come in that's about the difference in uh, the grout. Yeah, uh, they wanted to know yeah. about the pointing. Yes, so we have had to repoint uh, some of the buildings in various spots. Uh, as anybody with an old house knows, uh, water is your number one enemy. So over the years, uh, some places we have had some repointing done, uh, which is why you'll see some difference in the grouting both here on the kitchen building as well as the Hayward Washington house. Um, also, I was going to mention earlier, uh, this building here that it doesn't actually connect the kitchen house with the main house. It kind of has that appearance. Uh, this is not original. Um, this was added, we believe, in the 1880s uh, when the Hayward Washington house was owned by a family of bakers. Uh, and they actually operated uh, the bakery on the site. But you can see where there have been some changes made to this end of the house. 
Uh, down here, we have the original entrance to the basement. And then as you can see, this window has been moved. It originally would have been closer to the middle where the one up top is. So um, much like the Edmondson Austin house, it, these would have been completely separate spaces. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, we have a hyphen in there, but it um, that is something that um, would have been added once the quarters were being constructed. And if I could just chime in about washing uh, real quick. Mm -hmm. If y'all are asking about 18th century clothing of planters, if we're talking about linens and silks, um, the outer gowns probably weren't washed all that often. The laundry that's being done weekly is under things, it's shifts, it's stockings, it's uh, maybe petticoats, under petticoats, but um, the, the outer garments, those really um, delicate silk and linen things, they, um, there's probably not all that much of that going on. They probably would have been aired more than washed just for... Um, as um, a, yeah. as a, uh, question about uh, know of any crops in the garden. Uh, so there would have been um, a garden back here, a, a vegetable garden or something like that kind of for uh, personal use for the family, um, but there wouldn't have been anything um, commercial being grown back here. And I assume similar at the Edmondson also. So um, we actually had a question for you, Heather, about the privy. So the uh, the view that we're getting here, and maybe I'll move this just a little bit. Um, what we're looking at here is the northwest corner of the property. So as you look on your screen, just to the right of where the carriage house stands today, that's mm -hmm. where a privy would have been here at the Edmonston Alston House site. And I know that you were talking a little bit about the archeology span that's been done at Hayward Washington House. Um, EA House hasn't actually had any archeology span done, but um, that privy spot would be a great place to pick up some information um, about you know life, especially life in the work yard here. Um, you guys do have a, a privy there, don't you? Yes, we do. So uh, back here is the original privy. Um, you can see the door on this side, we've actually updated this side. So if you come visit the Hayward Washington House, this is our public washroom, <laughs> um, fully updated with plumbing now, but it was a two-sided privy originally. Um, the other side we currently use as a garden shed. And this was where um, a wealth of information came uh, on those digs. And we have a display case in the house with just a few of the items that have been discovered. Um, and as they label them, you know, they know where they were found. So my favorite one, um, and I like to tell the story, we actually found, and this is closer to the mid 1800s. So this was well after um, Hayward time in the house. So about the mid 1800s, when the house was being rented out as a boarding house, uh, underneath the privy, they actually found a guinea pig skull and it was near a few parrot bones. So we believe at some point in time, someone in the house had some rather exotic pets uh, because there was no evidence that, was, that it was any sort of food. Um, and so much like today, when your goldfish dies and you flush it down the toilet, uh, they were doing the same thing back then <laughs> with their pets. So. Uh, Man, that makes me feel less bad about flushing my old goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sure those are very well loved pets. That's just a very strange thing to find in the privy. That's yeah, interesting. That's a really cool it's story. The only, yeah, it's the only guinea pig stall um, that's been found in a dig here in Charleston. What a distinction to have. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, does anybody else have any questions? We know that there's a little bit of a delay here on our Facebooks. It's, you know, a few seconds worth of delays. So we do want to give you the opportunity to um, ask any more questions that you have. But um, oh, did the family use the same privy as the enslaved? That's a great question. What have you found there at Hayward Washington House? So we believe, uh, as I said, it was a two-sided privy. So we believe that one side would have been for the family and the other side would have been for the enslaved. Um, we don't 
know that specifically because obviously the the archaeology hasn't really revealed that <laughs> but um, sure that's what we believe and two we find indoor usage right so not just oh, absolutely. Um, yeah not just uh privy pot uh chamber pots but also necessary chairs right those chairs that look like these cushy big wing back chairs with nice cushions on the seat and then you lift up the seat and you find that chamber pot underneath so um not necessarily the choice of a family member perhaps if the weather is nice but yeah. if it's late at night if the weather is poor um then of course the families have the opportunity to uh take care of themselves indoors and leave an enslaved person to uh deal with the remains so yeah. um yeah there's lots of options we did just get a question about similarities between the edmonston alston house and the hayward washington house which is a beautiful segue because that was the next thing that i was gonna invite um virginia <laughs> and caitlin to talk about so virginia's all excited so virginia's got some stuff to say let's talk about some similarities yes so i love this question because i have worked at both properties basically <laughs> I started at the Hayward Washington House as an intern um, and am very familiar with both histories. Really, the Charleston history throughout the city overlaps quite a bit. I mean, no matter what family you're talking about, they're all using the same customs. They change slightly over time between the different centuries. Um, and we find that even the roles of the enslaved can shift uh, a little bit, but not very much. Um, and that's similar too between town and country living. It's still the same families. They still have the same customs, uh, cultures and all of that as well. When it comes to the outbuildings, I find that these are really quite similar. The setup, um, the hierarchy that Heather was talking about, but it seems here simply because we haven't done archeology span on the site at the Edmondson Austin house, there's so much more that I'm sure we would be able to find out um, sometime in the future. But it's great to have the evidence from the Hayward Washington House that, you know, informs us a little bit of probably what we will find here and how things were done here as well. Yeah, I mean, if we think about it, you know, the Hayward Washington House is an earlier time. And while we talk about how the institution of enslavement of people is a very dynamic thing it changes from place to place and from year to year but there are some things that we can see that persist throughout the institution so the way that urban plantations are set up whether it's in the 18th or 19th century really kind of persists through time so the the hayward washington house even as um a space that was constructed a little bit earlier you know it was occupied through the same time period and so we'll be able to uh, see a lot of similarity there and there should be as virginia said plenty to inform us um, i see a question came in about will there be any future archaeological plans at the ea house i couldn't say we don't have any plans right now so let's just uh say perhaps not but um we do hope maybe you know maybe someday that's just that's a that's a very big i don't know um, that's the shortest way to say that. I don't know. Um, we did have a question come in and we can speak to the 19th century. Heather, maybe you can speak to the 18th century, but um, the population of enslaved people in Charleston. Again, uh, folks, this is another one of those questions that there's not one answer. The answer in the 17 teens is different from the 1780s, is different from the 18 teens, is different from the 1860s and 80s. So we know that here um, at the EA House, we are estimating about 20,000 in the year 1860, just before the dawn of the American Civil War. Um, do you have any ideas about that for a little bit earlier in time, Heather? I don't have. Uh, exact numbers off the top of my head. However, and I think you mentioned this yesterday, we do know that the enslaved population generally equaled uh, the white population in the city. Um, and so, and for a while, there was actually more African Americans in Charleston than there were uh, white people. So, well, Absolutely. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. I know for a number of years that uh, remained the case here as well. Sure. There was a Black majority in South Carolina, in the entirety of Carolina Colony. There was a Black majority by 1740. 
So um, it, it stays that way, if not, you know, equalizing a little bit, but um, it, there was a black majority by 1740. So very early on in the history of the colony. All right. Well, um, oh, here's another one. Heather, are there any documents available to corroborate details of the families and sales? Um, oh, just a moment. Let me. Are there letters or diaries or records of the enslaved? Yeah, so for the Hayward Washington House, um, we mostly rely on, we do rely on public documents currently uh, for the knowledge that we have. So census records, and things like that. Um, we don't have a great deal of personal documents for Thomas Hayward Jr. and his family. Uh, when we do find references to enslaved people, uh, they are all in reference to the enslaved that were out at his uh, Whitehall plantation. So we don't have anything specific uh, to the city here, unfortunately. We have, we're fortunate to have some of those things for uh, the Joseph Manigo house. In fact, quite a few letters and diaries, um, but not the case here at the Hayward Washington house. Right. All right, folks. Well, um, as always, please, 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 if you have questions that uh, come to you later on, if you think of something or if you're trying to put a comment in right now and we just miss it, don't worry, we'll absolutely go back and I know that the Charleston Museum will do the same. We'll go back and we will answer your questions right there in the comment section. So. If you think of something else that you'd like to know that you're interested in, please let us know. And uh, we'll be happy to answer that for you. Um, but other than that, we just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Heather and the Charleston Museum there at the Hayward Washington House, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, do you have some programming, some digital programming that you'd like to share with us so that we know when to watch the Charleston Museum? Uh, we do. So we have our um, digital programming on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, um, Museum from Home every week, uh, typically. And uh, unfortunately, it's also at 11 a.m. Um, we are going to have some extra programming next week for Museum Week. So I believe we're going to be all five days next week doing the Museum from Home. Um, and I don't know if Liza, you can send me a quick message because I can't remember who's up tomorrow. <laughs> so, hey, I'm not uh, sure if, if Liza could... anyone could hear me. Um, this is Liza, but we do have Museum from Home next week with our, or tomorrow with our Curator of Historic Textiles, Virginia Thierman, um, talking about our Janssen bathing suits. Awesome, that's cool. All right, so make sure that you tune into the Charleston Museum for museums at Museum at Home. Um, like Heather said, every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 11 a.m. And they've got extra programming next week for Museum Week. Uh, we also have programming, and it's also at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. But we love our friends at the Charleston Museum, and um, we don't mind at all sharing the time slot because we know that all of these Facebook Lives get archived right here on our Facebook pages. So don't worry. Watch our friends, watch us. Just make sure that whichever one you don't catch live, you go back and watch. Make sure you go and watch the archived footage. We also have some programming coming up, more plugged into history. It's every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesdays are Let's Talk Tuesday. Wednesday is On the Farm Wednesday. Thursday is Hands-On History Thursday, and Friday is History Unplugged. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 11 a.m. Friday at 5 p.m. We also have some fun content coming up for Museum Week next week. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I wanted to remind you all to watch tomorrow at 11. Virginia here at the EA House has created uh, Charlotte Roos, the Alston family favorite dessert. And so she's got her own cooking show now. We're going to promote it. And uh, <laughs> so you can cook along with 
Virginia tomorrow at 11 a.m. Now, this is a pre-recorded video, so I'll just throw that out there. It is pre-recorded, so um, watch us live. You can still ask questions. We're going to make it a premiere, so you can still ask us questions in real time, and uh, we'll be there. But hopefully, we'll be able to do a lot more here with Liza and with Heather and with all the folks at the Charleston Museum. We so appreciate y'all joining us today, and thank you so much for showing us the Hayward Washington house and the work yard and really helping us visualize um, what this big open green space back here in the yard at the EA house may once have looked like. That's so valuable. And just thank you so much for being such great friends and partners. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, so hopefully you'll see more collaborations in future. Um, not only dropping us questions in the comments, guys, but make sure that you send us messages if you want to see more collaborations. And if you have ideas about what kind of collab you want to see, we are so excited to produce content for you with our friends and neighbors here downtown and um, out in the country. So definitely let us know what you want to see and we'll team back up. We love it. We're excited to do so. So, all right. Well, if anybody else has anything, guys, please uh, shout out here in the Zoom. Otherwise, we're going to let Sabrina end our live stream here and just thank you again so much. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Liza. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Caitlin. Oh, my gosh. It takes a village, you guys. We really appreciate y'all being here.